Hi, welcome to Navigating Early Postpartum Bladder, Bowel, and Scar Management. I'm Dr. Janet Yu, owner of Optimized Pelvic Health. Um, I've been a physical therapist for 13 years and a pelvic floor specialist for five years. And what does a pelvic floor physical therapist do? We help women with um, pelvic floor dysfunction, such as leakage, prolapse, pain, and diastasis diastasis recti resolve their symptoms. I do also help women who've never had um, uh, been pregnant with some uh, symptoms such as endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, vulvodynia, fertility concerns. So we also help with that. There's a broad scope of pelvic floor physical therapy from oncology to pediatrics to um, transition surgeries. I just mostly focus on working with women. And so um, when I'm not working as a physical therapist, I am, um, I am often running on the trails or chasing my two kids. So here we are. Um, I have a five-year-old daughter and a 14-month-old son. Okay. So the reason why I went into pelvic health is because around six years ago, um, I had a few friends who were pregnant at the time with some pelvic floor symptoms, such as incontinence and prolapse. And they mentioned that it was just normal part of being pregnant and postpartum, and they were just going to live with it. And I was like, hold on, there is an entire section of physical therapy that deals with um, pelvic floor dysfunction. When I went to go look for some resources for my friend, there was a handful, maybe, of pelvic floor physical therapists in the Bay Area at the time. So I started uh, focusing my coursework on pelvic floor health. And at the time, I was working in orthopedics and um, pelvic health. And what I was noticing was when I implemented pelvic floor strategies to my orthopedic patients, so patients with back pain, hip pain, SI joint pain, they were getting a lot better. So I really took a pivot about three years ago to really focus on pelvic floor health. And with that said, um, with working with a lot of postpartum women, I realized that there's not a lot of education on what to do in this early postpartum period. There's so many changes during this time period, but there's not a lot of information to help, uh, help you transition. A lot of the information goes from um, childbirth, labor and delivery, then you start exercises. But what about all these things that happen in those first few weeks of postpartum that you have a lot of questions about. So that's why I decided to provide this presentation. So um, before we start on um, talking about uh, bladder, um, bowel and scar management, I wanna go over some red flags. So we're gonna go over infection, hemorrhage and postpartum preeclampsia. So infection, the peak occurrence is one week postpartum. And um, you might feel like a fever, having a lot more fatigue than normal. And I know this is a new phase, so um, gauging fatigue might be a little bit hard when you have a newborn at home, but it would be just extra fatigue, like you're sick, have the flu, something like that. You wanna look out for wound site, redness, tenderness, or swelling, sudden urgency, urinary urgency, frequency, burning, and sudden pubic pain. So these are all um, signs of infection. And you do wanna keep an eye on the sudden uh, urinary urgency, frequency, and burning, cause that could be an indicator for a UTI. And just wanna make sure that when you're um, in that postpartum period that you reach out to your doctor if you have symptoms of a UTI. Some of the risk factors for having an infection is having operative procedures like having a cesarean, a vacuum extraction, using forceps. Multiple cervical examinations can also increase your risk factor for infection, having a prolonged labor that's uh, greater than 24 hours, prolonged rupture of membranes, uh, manual extraction of the placenta and catheterization can all um, increase your risk for having an infection. Let me come back to this. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. The next red flag we want to talk about is 
hemorrhage. So it's most common in that first hour, but it can occur as late as six to 12 weeks. And um, the, some of the signs of a hemorrhage is rapid heart rate, nausea, loss of consciousness, a decline in blood pressure. Blood, the blood loss can lead to shortness of breath, anemia, and significant fatigue. The risk factors can be having um, a lot of children, five or greater, large baby, labor, long, active labor long, lasting longer than three hours. Um, again, going with that prolonged labor, retained placenta, meaning that um, the placenta needs manual assistance to be delivered. Placenta previa, which is the placenta is implanted close to the cervix. Abruptio placenta, meaning the placenta starts to pull away from the uterus early. Labor induction, topolytics to stop labor and operative procedures like a cesarean or a vacuum extraction. Postpartum preeclampsia. Um, it's a very rare condition. Um, it can happen within uh, 48 hours to six weeks after childbirth. And this is a condition where you have high blood pressure and protein in your urine. Um, symptoms can include severe headaches, changes in your vision, such as vision loss, blurry vision, or light sensitivity. Um, you can have upper right abdominal pain and decrease in urination. Some of the risk factors are high blood pressure in your recent pregnancy, obesity, um, having a multiple pregnancy, chronic high blood pressure, having type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So here is a summary of some danger signs that, you know, if you have any of these, please just check in to your OBGYN or your midwife. And that would be a fever above 100, and 100 degree, 100.4 degrees, nausea, vomiting, um, pain or burning with urination, bleeding that's heavier than um, your nor normal menstrual period. Um, and this is a little different for postpartum. It, it's just, if it's significantly more than your menstrual cycle. And we just want to be aware that if you um, do more heavy duty work and heavy duty postpartum could mean unloading the dishwasher, sweeping the ground or something like that, that can increase lochia shedding. So you want to um, see if you can scale down your activities take a little rest and see if that changes the, um, the shedding that you're having. Um, dropping, drop in your blood pressure, elevated heart rate um, for extended periods of time, severe pain in your lower abdomen, um, pain, swelling, or tenderness in the legs, chest pain, coughing, gasping for air, red streaks or painful new bumps on breast tissue, pain that worsens um, or doesn't improve after having an episiotomy, a perineal tear, or abdominal incision, redness or discharge from the, the, any of the wound sites. If you have foul odor with vaginal discharge or you have feelings of hopelessness that last more than 10 days, we really want you to check into a provider and just really rule out um, the big, bad, scary things that can be happening. So make sure you check into your provider if you have any of these going on. So we're moving to our main topics about peeing, pooping, and scar management. So we're going to go into peeing. So in this early postpartum period, um, mothers can experience urinary retention or urinary leakage. And urinary retention is when you don't have the sensation that you need to go to the bathroom. Um, this is more common with catheterization and, um, and longer catheterization can lead to having UTI, having discomfort, having incontinence. Um, oops, I keep going forward, sorry. Let me bring us back. So when you have urinary retention, what you want to do is do all the things that you can do to help your pelvic floor muscles relax. I do find oftentimes that my people with urinary retention, that there is overactivity of the pelvic floor. Um, so what it is, is when there's overactive pelvic floor, it sends signals that, um, that doesn't allow your body to um, tell the bladder that you need to go. You, your pelvic floor muscles have to be relaxed for your bladder to have the signals that you're ready to avoid. So you want to do all the things to help relax 
the pelvic floor muscles. So some of the things you can do are having your feet supported. And um, this happens most often in this immediate postpartum stage. So the things that we're talking about right now is um, things that you would most likely do while you're still in the hospital. So um, you would have your feet supported um, and this allows your hip and your pelvic muscles to relax. You want to make sure that your pelvic muscles are relaxed so that, um, that it doesn't put more pressure onto the bladder. You want to make sure that you take a warm shower. Um, this warm shower can help relax your muscles and relax the nervous system. Another strategy is diaphragmatic breathing. And you want to make sure that um, when you're doing diaphragmatic breaths that you take a nice long exhalation breath. So the inhalation portion is more paired with your stress nervous system. The exhalation is more paired with your relaxation relaxation nervous system. So your breath should look more like a small inhale and then nice long exhale versus a big inhale and a small exhale. Right. So you want to make sure that you do the first strategy, which is small inhale and then long exhale. This last strategy, um, peppermint oil is actually research, um, research based. So about 20 drops of peppermint oil um, in the toilet bowl can help with um, urinary retention. So you can sit with 20 drops of peppermint oil in the toilet bowl and practice your diaphragmatic strategies. And that should help with urinary retention. So on the opposite side is urinary leakage. So 33% of women have urinary leakage at three months postpartum. 92% um, of those continue to have leakage at one year. And these statistics are very similar to people with prolapse and people with diastasis recti. So it's really important that you get into pelvic floor physical therapy um, when you are experiencing any of these urinary leakage, prolapse, or diastasis recti at that six week check um, with your OB or with, with your midwife. This way you can kind of work on things right away and not develop any comp compensatory strategies. So with urinary incontinence, um, there is multiple different um, types of urinary incontinence. The major two are urge incontinence and stress incontinence. Urge is incontinence is um, where you feel like you really have to go to the bathroom. Um, you might have that sensation that you really have to go. And when you do, not a lot of um, urine comes out. So that's urge incontinence. Stress incontinence is more associated with um, like leakage while sneezing, coughing, jumping. Um, and that is usually when people talk about leakage, that's what they usually talk about is um, that stress incontinence. So in general, um, with urinary incontinence, it does happen more with vaginal versus cesareans. Urge incontinence um, is associated with more cesarean births and um, as well as instrument assisted deliveries. Um, immediately after giving birth, urge incontinence is more prevalent. However, it does improve with healing. Um, stress incontinence, again, is the one that we think of when it's prolonged incontinence, and that's usually with leakage, with um, sneezing, coughing, and jumping, and that is more associated with, um, with vaginal delivery. Okay, so what do you do with um, urinary incontinence? And this is more for stress incontinence. Um, so we want to know the knack. The knack is a reflex that um, you might need to retrain postpartum. What it is, is the pelvic floor should lift before you sneeze and cough. And so what you have to do occasionally is practice this after giving birth. So go ahead and try to do a Kegel right now. It's whatever you think is a Kegel, go ahead and try that now. And then, so you can try that before you sneeze and cough. Now, if you are having trouble doing a Kegel, try this cue. Uh, visualize where your clitoris is. And what you want to do is think about it nodding. 
downward, okay? So go ahead and do your pelvic floor contraction that way. And you should feel your pelvic floor lift. So that's the neck. I say practice it. Uh, every time you sneeze and cough, and what will happen is as you practice this over time, this will become more of a reflex. Again, we see this diaphragm breath. The reason why it's so important is because the diaphragm and the pelvic floor mirror each other. So here's the pelvic floor and um, here is the diaphragm, or I'm sorry, <laughs> here is the diaphragm, here's the pelvic floor. And what it does is every time you inhale, the diaphragm moves down because the lungs are filling with air. And so the pelvic floor should respond to move down. And then, so that gives it a stretch. And then when you exhale, your um, diaphragm lifts up and so does your pelvic floor. So you're getting almost like a, a pumping effect with the diaphragm as you um, do some diaphragmatic breaths. So pressure systems, you want to avoid holding your breath or squeezing your muscles as you lift your baby or stand up. Really work on relaxing your abs and your glutes. So if this ball is your abdomen, and the top part is your diaphragm, the bottom part is your pelvic floor. If you hold or squeeze your muscles, your ab muscles, what happens is all of this pressure goes down into the pelvic floor muscles um, towards the bladder. So it makes you feel like you need to go to the bathroom. So what you wanna do is exhale when you lift up your baby, exhale when you stand up, um, relax your abs and your glutes so you're not constantly putting pressure um, on, on your bladder and on your pelvic floor. Okay. Next thing we have is bowels, pooping. That first postpartum poop can be scary. So the tissues feel raw, incisions are healing, um, and about 50 to 60% of postpartum moms experience constipation. So what to do? Um, you want to make sure that your bowel movements are as soft as possible. Um, that way, when you do have um, that your bowel movement, that it's not you're not straining, it's not putting a lot of pressure. You just want to make sure that the stool is as soft as it can be, and that could mean drinking a lot of fluid, eating some nutritious food with lots of fiber. Um, that's your oatmeal, your soups with some veggies, and continue to take your magnesium and stool softeners. You want to make sure you continue to do this through your postpartum period. Um, and what we're really looking for in pelvic health is that you have a daily bowel movement that you don't have to strain that you, it feels like when you're done, you're completely empty and that you don't have to sit, um, on, you don't have to go back and have another bowel movement. It doesn't feel like stool is stuck. Um, you got to keep an eye on those types of symptoms that could mean that there's a little bit of what's called a rectal seal, meaning that the rectum is pushing into the vagina so that the stool is pocketed there. That is a whole nother conversation that we can go over. Um, the second thing you want to do is sitting position, making sure that again, your feet are supported on either squatty potty or a stool. Uh, and this allows for the rectum to be a little bit more open. So I should show this. So this is your pelvis and inside is your bladder, your uterus and your rectum. I'm going to take this out. I'm going to take the uterus out too. And what you see inside are the pelvic floor muscles. That hole there is where the rectum goes. And so what happens is when your feet is on the squatty potty, it takes this angle right here and it straightens, straightens it out a little bit, making the stool a, li a little easier to evacuate. What happens is when the pelvic floor muscles are tight because the pelvic floor muscles wrap around the bottom like so, when they're tight, it cinches it and it makes this angle um, a lot smaller. So that goes like this. So it makes it harder to pass stool. So that is why you want to make sure that you're Feet are relaxed on a squatty potty, um, or your muscle, or your feet are supported on a squatty potty or a stool, so that your muscles can relax and put your um, rectum into a better position for a bowel movement. 
post cesarean, you do want to maybe have a shorter stool. Uh, the higher it is, the more pressure that is on your abdomen. So that could, um, that can just lead to some discomfort there. So you might want something a little lower. A uh, squatty potty is about seven inches tall. Um, you might want something just a little bit shorter to help with, um, to put under your feet after a cesarean. Um, the third thing, thing you can do is abdominal massage. I like the, I love you massage. That's the L I U massage daily for five to 10 minutes. You want to do this every day, even having normal bowel movements. You want to make sure that um, your bowel movements are consistent, that you no longer need to have stool softeners or magnesium um, before you stop doing the abdominal massage. So the ILU massage is, let me back up, is starting on the right side, you can sweep up for the I. And then for the L, you wanna go up and across. And then the U is up, across and down. So you wanna start from the right going to the left. And that's just how the bowels move in our body. Now, research shows it doesn't really matter. You can rub your stomach, you can move it all around. Um, you can almost do a skin lift technique, which I call like skin pinching. That all of that can really help with, um, and with improving the bowel movements, just decreasing um, the pressure on having that bowel movement. So you just gotta be careful if you have a cesarean so that you don't rub that cesarean scar. Now, um, there is a scar management side of things when you're having the bowel movement. Using a pillow to support your abdomen can be helpful um, while you're sitting um, on the toilet. So you wanna grab a pillow, Hold it, have your feet up a little bit and brace with a pillow while you're having the bowel movement. That can help decrease the discomfort and pressure on your abdomen. With the, if you had a perineal um, tear, what you wanna do is, um, so here's the perineum right in through this space. If there's tears, it's usually kind of down in this direction. So what you wanna do is take a piece of tissue um, and press that up against the space here. And you wanna support it with one or two fingers and you can have your bowel movement that way. So that way this area is supported, it's splinted, and you're providing the space a support as you have your bowel movement. Some other helpful tips are um, you can use a travel bidet or a peri bottle. So there are now travel bidets that look like um, uh, electric toothbrushes. You can use that so that way um, if you had a tear, you're not constantly rubbing and irritating the scar. And the same goes with a peri bottle. Um, so uh, with that, chewing gum several times a day can decrease the amount of time it takes to have that first bowel movement. So this was research-based that you can chew gum. Um, it said four times a day for 30 minutes. I know that's quite a bit of time. We wanna make sure that you don't get jaw issues from it, but chewing gum a couple of times a day um, while you're still in the hospital can help you get that first bowel movement going. Um, Again, exhale during the bowel movement to allow the pelvic floor muscles to relax. Um, there is also, if you have hemorrhoids, which is fairly common postpartum, you can use ice, you can use witch hazel. And the biggest thing is to avoid straining and straining, um, you know, pairs with that using that exhale breath and allowing those pelvic floor muscles to open. You really wanna visualize that pelvic floor between your butt bones that you sit on here, really relaxing and opening as you're having that bowel movement. So we're gonna go into scar management. Um, scar tissue in general should move without pain. Um, discomfort or any itchiness, we have cesarean scars and perineal scars. With cesarean scars, restrictions can lead to impairments in scar mobility, posture, fertility, pressure tolerance, leakage, actually pelvic pain and low back pain. 33% of births are cesarean births. And of that 30%, 20 of those are primary cesarean births. So 80% of people are having repeated cesareans and that could be a lot of scar tissue if we don't work on that area. So what can you do? Um, 
you can use silicone sheets. Um, there are sheets of silicone that you put over scar tissue and that can help improve the color, flatten the scar, improve mobility. You can use this after the incision is healed. That means no stitches, no scabs, once that's all healed, it can be as early as two weeks. If you still have stitches three or four weeks postpartum, don't put the silicone sheet on quite yet, but you wanna wear this daily for 12 to 24 hours for months or up to a year. Desensitization. So this is using um, from soft materials to harsh materials to desensitize, get the skin and the surgical area used to having something touch it. So you can start with something like Kleenex, if you have silk, cotton, um, something like that, something softer to kind of rub the area. You can start on the outside of the skin, like um, around the incision outside the area versus like right on the incision. You can start this as early as two to four weeks postpartum. Scar massage after the incision is healed. So everything is healed. There is no red spots. There is no scabs anywhere. Um, you want to be able to move the scar in all directions. Healing can take eight to 12 weeks and it should not hurt. Let's see, I'm going to come back to this. So with, um, with cesarean scars, what you want to do is, um, so there's a cesarean scar like right across my arm. What you want to do, I'll go this way. What you want to do is with time, you want to be able to actually lift the scar. So like that line that you see on my arm, which is my bone, you want to be able to lift it and move it up and down. So what you might want to do is see which direction up or down feels better. If it feels better moving it up and more painful moving it down, you want to pull the skin up. The same with side to side. So if you feel um, going to the left and then to the right, seeing which direction um, feels less painful, you wanna kind of massage in that direction. So if it's going to my left, you wanna pull and just kind of massage in that direction. And then you can always do a twisting maneuver. So picking up the skin and just kind of turning it. You can lift it up all the way, like so like you're pinching it, or you can just go over the skin and just do this. So again, so it'd be side to side over the scar, up and down, just finding the direction of ease. So again, if it's pulling down, just pulling that down, holding it. And relaxing, holding it, relaxing. And then you can check the other direction after you've done the direction that feels good. And then twisting. You can see even on my arm, there's a direction that the body likes better. So here, holding it and then checking the other way. Okay. Perineal um, scars. So restrictions are associated with painful intercourse, urinary fecal incontinence, prolapse, and should say postpartum depression. <laughs> and in general, 25% of wounds will get infected. Scar massage. So you want to make sure that um, this area, like any scar, that the tissue moves. So with clean hands, you want to sweep gently across the scar. Maybe uncomfortable, but it should not be painful. So here's the grading for perineal tears. Um, so here is the vaginal opening, the vulva here, your anus. So with perineal tears, grade one is essentially just a tear to this tissue here not necessarily into the muscle, just a little bit on this tissue right at the vulva. And grade two tears can be anywhere along this muscle tissue here. Grade three is when the tear reaches all the way to kind of the soft tissue of your anal opening. And then grade four is a complete tear all the way through the anus into that muscle here. A majority of people have, um, if they have a tear, will have grade one or grade two. A small number of people do have grade three or four tears. So what you want to do, as the picture shows, is um, it's different strategies. You can use um, a sweeping motion. So it's easier um, when you do it on yourself to use your thumb. Um, but you can do a sweeping motion here. 
pressing down on the tissue and just stretching. And the same technique that I just showed for the cesarean can be used for the perineal tear, where you, if it feels um, less, more pain or less painful to pull down and out versus almost pushing it in, pull out. If it feels um, less painful to push the tissue to the left, push it to the left versus pulling it to the right. So you can do that with scar massage as well. Um, so for a perineal um, scars, what you can do is ice pack that can help minimize any swelling and decrease pain. But in general, if heat feels better, you can use heat, but with therapies, usually ice is used for that um, immediate acute phase. You can do a sitz bath. With that said, it's really hard to do postpartum where you set, two to, um, set aside time two to three times a day to sit in a sitz bath. So even though that is recommended, realistically, that may not happen. You can use a local anesthetic, a lidocaine spray, gel, or cream. Um, Epifoam is another option for a local anesthetic to the area to decrease the pain. You can use a cushion when you sit, um, sometimes sitting right on the space here can make it feel raw and painful. Maybe using a cushion there can really help decrease the pressure um, on the perineal tear. Okay. So some of the things that I didn't mention in this presentation is some of the other ancillary things that can contribute to some of your symptoms. I think the major one I see is stress. Um, that increase in stress nervous system can contribute to um, urinary incontinence. It can contribute to having um, bowel issues, constipation. It can actually contribute to um, the cesarean scar and the perineal scar not feeling 100% normal. Um, a lot of times when I work with my postpartum moms, when we help them find strategies to relax, um, that can um, really help manage their symptoms. Um, so I say find things that you like to do. It could be if you're up for a massage, um, just sitting and resting, um, meditation or prayer or um, something that you really like to do that gives you um, relaxation. Oh, I'm planning on doing another presentation on some of these other um talks. Um, I know a few people actually speaking of I, a few people have had questions about um, healing of the tissues. Um, a lot of people are um, are released or cleared at six weeks postpartum for exercise, for intercourse. And it really just depends on the person. Six weeks is just this arbitrary number that most of the time people, um, people's incisions, their scar, the tissues have healed, but that's not always the case. And so you want to make sure that there is no, um, that any, um, any uh, surgical sites are all healed up. If there's any stitches that they've all been dissolved or removed and is gone. Um, Cause even if you were clear for intercourse at six weeks, if there's a little bit of a stitch left, you don't want that to like break open and, um, and cause other effects on your body. So you just want to make sure that you, all your wounds are completely healed before you have intercourse. And also in regards to exercise, same thing. If you're having feelings of urinary incontinence, prolapse, pelvic pain, you want to hold off on like heavy duty exercise. And by heavy duty, I mean, resuming running, resuming um, like orange theory or CrossFit. You want you really want to make sure that you get some of these other symptoms resolved before you start having compensatory strategies to get you through um, the uh, running orange theory CrossFit. And there is research to show that with running um, that you don't want to start that until 12 weeks postpartum. So um, when do you want to see a pelvic floor physical therapist? So I recommend people see a pelvic floor physical therapist if you're having symptoms um, longer than six weeks. So with urinary or 
fecal leakage. It's not normal to have um, leakage with coughing, sneezing, walking, um, standing up. If you're having this symptoms longer than six weeks, by all means, please reach out to a pelvic floor physical therapist. Prolapse. Again, I will probably go over this in another presentation, but prolapse is feelings of heaviness in the vagina. It feels like a tampon is falling out and that there's downward pressure. If you're experiencing pelvic, back, or hip pain um, beyond six weeks postpartum, you really want to work with a pelvic floor physical therapist. We can assess the entire body to, to really kind of figure out why your symptoms are happening. Um, the difference between pelvic floor physical therapy and um, regular physical therapists are we do internal assessments of the pelvic floor. Um, as you can see, the pelvic floor muscles are inside your pelvis. We can really only access it either intravaginally or intrarectally. So you want to make sure that you do work with somebody that have the, um, the capacity to do an internal assessment um, so that we can see if the muscles are weak, if they're feeling tight, um, or um, what is going on in the pelvic floor. It would be like if you were going to see a physical therapist for leg issues and they don't touch your thigh. Okay. And then scar management. If, um, you know, we talked about the, that it can take about 12 weeks for some of the scarring to heal up, but if you're having some, um, scar, it just doesn't feel like the rest of um, the skin in the area, if it's tender, if it's numb, if it's causing you pain, if it hurts to wear jeans, definitely reach out to a pelvic floor physical therapist. We can help show you different techniques and ways of working on the scar. And again, with um, either cesarean or perineal scar, that can lead to other things such as urinary incontinence, prolapse symptoms, pelvic pain. So you do wanna make sure that the scar gets looked at. And part of it too is um, a lot of people do think that people who have cesareans are, um, don't have pelvic floor dysfunction, but what happens is the incision for the cesarean is like right about here. And that is close enough to some of these muscles of your pelvic floor. So that plays a role in how your bladder is being supported. Um, so you definitely want to reach out to a pelvic floor physical therapist if you're having um, any of these issues with urinary or fecal leakage, prolapse, pelvic pain, back pain, um, or just your scar does not feel um, like normal skin. So this is where you can find me. Um, my website is optimizedpelvichealth.com. Um, you can reach me via email at drjanet at optimizedpelvichealth. My Instagram is optimizedpelvichealth. Um, hopefully easy to remember. I am on, my clinic is at 750 North Capitol. That's right on the corner, maybe in Capitol between McKee and Berryessa. And, or you can give us a phone call. Um, I hope this was... Um, a lot of information that is helpful for this early postpartum recovery. Um, and again, if you're interested in different um, topics or presentations, I will be working on sharing those in the upcoming months. Thank you.